Socially radical. Socially radical. Socially radical. Socially radical. Socially radical. Socially radical. Guitar. Welcome to another episode of Socially Radical Guitarist. The song you heard just now was Worldless from the artist I Will Never Be the Same. Kind of strange when you realize the artist sounds like a song name, but it's very interesting. And um, 
the album is uh, standby 2009 album. It's been remastered quite a few times. So um, with that, um, we're going to do the disclaimer. Um, anything that I or my guests say on this show or the respective opinions of the host and the guest, they have nothing to do with uh, Radio Waterloo, any of its subsidiaries or any of its affiliates. So... No, try as you might, you cannot sue public radio over this program. And uh, yes, while the African and Caribbean Inclusion Center, ASA Canada, is sponsoring this show, um, the opinions of the hosts and the the guests expressed on this show are the express opinions of the host and the guests solely. They have nothing to do with the African and Caribbean Inclusion Center, any of its uh, affiliates or subsidiaries. So, no, don't sue the nonprofit either. Support the nonprofit. Especially support the initiative for full inclusion, full equality, full integration. Um, I say it many different ways, put it the different order each time, but the message is the same, the goal is the same, and the purpose is the same, which is to make all African and Caribbeans in particular, in particular, and refugees and newcomers in general, come to Canada and feel included. And uh, yeah, so let's just go over um, this. Uh, qu- quite a beautiful song. Um, what's amazing about it is basically the songwriting as a whole. And how every instrument complements and puts things together. The, the way that Josh Ashley puts the music together is brilliant. Each part is relatively simple. But because of the way he uses dynamics and the way he emphasizes his lyrics, um, it, it all meshes together to make this very beautiful piece. Um, here's ba- uh, the basic chorus. Really simple. It's just... Just basically that. Very simple stuff. Um, and uh, you'll have the guitar basically work along those lines. Um, there's a nice little bridge part where... Is doing a nice little bend. That's it. Um, you'll have those moments, uh, a little, you know, slightly beautiful, I mean, slight yet beautiful uh, gu- guitar licks to go with music. Um, and everything all complements and works together to make this beautiful piece. Um, as you can tell, based on you know the lack of listens, the lack of exposure for "I Will Never Be the Same," independently released, um, you can tell by the lyrics that he's not pandering to the market trends in any way. And. That's the price he paid, and that's the price that uh, Western proletarian culture is paid. Um, song, 12 years. It's been around for 12 years. And, um, you know, it hasn't gotten that exposure. Not everybody knows about it. Not everybody knows about his skill as, as a musician. He's, uh, he's worked since then. Created a lot of beautiful pieces. And, you know, this ends up being the result. Um, By the way, we have a guest. Um, The the guest upcoming is uh, 
for the first time, somebody that's not going along with the party line, at least not completely, um, is from a different party. Uh, it's the Green Party. His name is Dimitri Lascaris. Um, most people on the you know militant left know him. Uh, he he was a contender for the Green Party race, and had he won, he would have gotten national exposure. Would have been that close to seeing you know a taste of what radical politics would ha have to have looked like on uh, the national stage on a national debate would have been very interesting to see um but you know the typical result happened you had a lot of people that were vehemently pro-imperialist within that party smashed it down and um now we're gonna he's gonna be here with me reflecting on what happened um and of course you know we're probably you're probably gonna get the pro-liberal disclaimers they usually get from green party members but it'll be interesting interesting to see a new perspective than what we usually see on the show so um yeah look forward to that um it'll be coming up uh, you know relatively quickly the segment's going to be short leave them you know time to speak and to discuss the issues um you know the song coming up next uh is traverser that's another band that was kind of overlooked. They do um, a nice little blend of indie rock and progressive rock. A lot like uh, the the band that we had last week, Adola. Adola, um, they make more use of uh, sophisticated guitar lyrics and uh, harmonies and things like that. But um, even, you know, Traverser... You could tell there's a lot of talent within the band and uh, within, you know, the singer and uh, even the uh, guitarist. So, um, yeah, look forward to that as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to be looking forward to hearing what uh, Dimitri Lascaris' perspective is on, you know, the Green Party's shameful, shameful pro-nuclear war vote. Um, the one that they shamelessly, shamelessly and pathetically indulged in, uh, I believe it was last year, saying that uh, China was doing a genocide. I mean, that is... Unbelievable. I, I I actually haven't heard his perspective before yet, and I'm going to look for it, you know, asking him what, what it is. Um, he's vehemently pro-Palestinian, and, uh, you know, the thing is, um, a lot of people feel that that was the reason why he lost the, the, uh, the race, is because even though he got that support behind him just having um that that anti-israeli occupation stance um was definitely um an anathema to the um party brass the old guard that knows that you're supposed to pander to the working class here but brutalize them abroad. That's the general policy of social democracy. It's to pander, give piecemeal gestures, and then brutalize them abroad. But we'll see. We'll see what uh, uh, Demetri Lascaris has to say. Um, I'm very looking, looking forward to hearing from him because actually he was one of those major figures that helped to radicalize me when it was on the real news. Um, I, uh, I learned a lot about Marxism and the, the Greek political struggle, the radical history. Um, 
the first time I learned that they went through a military dictatorship was from him when he uh, had a discussion on the real notes. So it, it, it was very enlightening for me politically and helped me to move and move and move. And um, being who I am, I ended up even farther to the left than he is. I mean, I'm a communist now, so it's amazing. It's amazing to see what can influence you and uh, change you over time. Um, and having him on is a real honor. I'm glad that he deci decided to take it up. So, um, without further ado, we're going to have the intermission. Uh, the intermission will be Traverser, uh, and the song is going to be EMD from the album Telemetry. And then after that, we're going to have the interview with our guest, Dimitri Lascaris. So look forward to that and stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Socially Radical Guitars. The song you heard just now was uh, from Traviser called EMD from the album Telemetry. Um, it's a very nice mix of indie from a really, really a provisioned, skilled and polished guitarist and a very polished band. So stay to listen to that track and understand your culture. It's your culture that's being suppressed. So uh, we have our guest, um, our guest, uh, well, uh, well known uh, among left circles in Canada. Uh, he started out as basically a lawyer for the enemy, uh, a, <laughs> uh, a corporate lawyer, um, and then moved on to being a lawyer for the people, being a class action lawyer. Um, he, he went through that political evolution uh, and uh, a very well-known, uh, well-studied historian of uh, struggle of the political struggle in Greece. So welcome, Dimitri Lascarius. How's everything? Great, Christian. Pleasure to, uh, pleasure to be here. I look forward to a radical conversation. <laughs> All right. Great. Great. So let's 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 uh, begin with the, your political uh, basically your your career evolution. How did you end up going from corporate to class action? What what what, what was there anything political going on in your mind at that point or was it just you having gone through that route because that's how you were trained in, in school? Yeah, I think we have to go back further in time. Uh, you know, I, I was raised politically speaking in a, what I would call a schizophrenic environment because my parents uh, emigrated from Greece in the aftermath of uh, the second world war. Uh, they lived through as very young children of one of the most brutal Nazi occupations in Europe. And then the, you know, at the moment where the Nazis were expelled from Greece, the ascended power in Greece was the communist movement. They are the ones who had most effectively resisted the Nazi occupation in the southern part of the country where my parents were from. And the, um, the British and the Americans were quite concerned that the communists would take power. And so they assembled together a motley collection of monarchists and Nazi collaborators and uh, neoliberals uh, to effectively launch an armed struggle against the communists. And uh, there then followed a brutal civil war in Greece. And by the time the communists were defeated with the help of the ruthless British, the country lay in smoking ruins. And out of that uh, disaster, my parents were afforded the opportunity by the government of Canada to come to Greece they were in their teens and they had no high school education at all, not even a year of high school education. And they were raised on a poor farm in the South, had many horrible memories of the Second World War and the, and the, uh, and the Civil War that followed. Uh, and they took the opportunity to come to Canada, not because they felt a burning desire to leave Greece, they didn't, uh, but because there was absolutely no economic opportunity for them. So I came out of that environment, but at the same time, my parents were quite nationalistic and right wing. They were raised in a fairly religious family. Uh, you know, their family was much more aligned with uh, the monarchist side uh, than it was with the communists. In fact, when I was a kid growing up, you know, communism was a dirty word. Even if you supported the Social Democratic Party in Greece, uh, which was called PASOK, uh, you were considered a pariah in my family. Uh, so it was a very right-wing upbringing, even though we came from very humble origins. And that's why I say it was kind of schizophrenic. So when I went off to law school, uh, you know, and then was afforded the opportunity to work on Wall Street, I really had a conflicted uh, political identity. You know, on the one hand, I had been raised in this right wing environment, but at the same time, I was very conscious of the fact that my family came from oppression and poverty and uh, a complete lack of privilege. And I didn't at all identify with what I discovered on Wall Street. And what I discovered on Wall Street was uh, just a, a milieu of extraordinary privilege. You know, everybody I dealt with, it, virtually all of them had gone to a private school. They then attended an Ivy League school because their parents were someone special. Uh, you know, a lot of them had a Roman numeral after their name. This was all very foreign and alien to me. And I saw firsthand very quickly how their privileges had uh, given them extraordinary advantages in life, which I had never uh, 
uh, even dreamt of uh, of enjoying. And, and so the, I, I really felt alien in that environment. Um, and, and especially and, and as time went by, seeing what I saw, you know, how they brought to bear their privilege in order to suppress uh, the types of legislative reforms and regulatory actions that were necessary for the protection of ordinary Americans, I decided very quickly that that was not, wasn't for me. And I left the practice of law. I just, I was so disenchanted by it that I, I went off and I did something quite unusual for a few years. I was a blackjack card counter, uh, some disgruntled Wall Street lawyers, because I wasn't the only one on Wall Street. There were quite a few of us. We somehow gravitated to each other. And a couple of them, uh, brother and sister who had gone to Yale and Stanford, worked at two Wall Street firms and got to know me in the course of my work. They decided to create a blackjack card county team. And we viewed ourselves as, you know, basically uh, sort of taking from the rich and giving to ourselves, the rich being the casino industry. Uh, so I did that for a few years. And I realized after doing that for some time, and I didn't make a lot of money, I made enough money to, you know, basically support myself, my wife, my kids, and comfortably, but I was certainly making less money than I had made as a lawyer in Wall Street. Um, I realized that what I was doing had no social utility at all. You know, on the one hand, yes, it's true. We were fighting large, massive, multi-billion dollar corporations who were ruthless in exploiting the public. Uh, but we weren't giving anything. It was simply it was, a, it was a wealth transfer from those casino corporations to us. And so I became, you know, I, did, I, did, I wanted to use my skills as a lawyer to actually begin to do something that had social utility and something that was an advantage to people who were disadvantaged. And that's when I was presented an opportunity to become a class actions lawyer. And I finally found a place in the law that I felt very comfortable with uh, from sort of a, an ethical and moral perspective. Uh, and did that for 15, 10, 12 years, I think. And then I was, I, I was very fortunate in, in that and was very uh, uh, successful endeavor. And I got to the age of 54 and realized that I didn't really need to work to make money anymore. Uh, so I said, uh, it's time for me to become an activist and a, an independent journalist and devote myself to politics if I can. Uh, so I gave up the practice of law, at least, uh, at least class actions law. I started to do a lot of pro bono work. And, uh, and that's, that's where I am today. You know, I spend a lot of time doing pro bono work. I do a little bit of paid work, if it's of interest to me, uh, of a class actions nature. Uh, I do a lot of uh, activism and uh, a fair bit of independent journalism as well. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but that's kind of, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of other things that happened along the way in my political journey, but it, it, those are the broad strokes. Ah, it's a great answer. And um, we love long-winded answers because <laughs> we, it's a great way for our listeners to understand who you are. Um, if you, you looked at previous interviews, nobody's ever had a problem with how I've interviewed them or okay. being long-winded. We let you be you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, I guess this this then goes into um, your participation in the Green Party. And um, I want to ask a little bit about um, the contentious leadership race, uh, particularly your platform on eco-socialism and uh, what ended up happening there. So. What was the, the the message you were trying to bring out within the Green Party uh, when, when you ran for the leadership position? Um, do you think that there are things you could have done better uh, uh, to win that position? Um, or do you think there were just structural disagreements or ideological disagreements that couldn't be reconciled? Uh, and do you in a way feel vindicated by the spectacular crash that happened with the Nami Paul's uh, campaign. Uh, that's a pretty, that's a pretty loaded yeah. question, but you know, <laughs> just, just wonder. Yeah. There's a, well, there's a few questions in there. So yeah. Uh, try to deal with them in the order in which you, uh, you asked them uh, in terms of whether we could have done anything better. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we didn't have a professional campaign team. Uh, it started with me going to like, you know, I, I struggled for three or four months with the whole question of whether I should run. Um, I actually, um, you know, uh, at that time, I, virtually nobody in the Green Party knew anything about Annemie Paul. Uh, and 
she had almost no public record at all at that time. It was very unusual for somebody entering a leadership race. Um, and so uh, I actually reached out to her uh, before entering the race because I thought, you know, I, I was intrigued and I thought maybe the right thing for me to do is to support um, this candidate from a racialized community who was speaking a language that was, you know, fairly progressive, but I really couldn't, I couldn't get a sense from her public record because it was so limited whether she in fact was radical, whether she would view herself as being open socialist. So I asked her if she would meet with me in Toronto and I said, and I told her very clearly, I'll come to where you live, uh, you know, at a time and place of your convenience. And I just wanna to talk to you about sort of core issues and figure out, you know, whether I should support you rather than enter the race myself. And to my surprise and disappointment, she refused to meet with me. Um, I later came to believe, uh, I can't say this with certainty, she didn't explain why, uh, but I think it had to do with my position with respect to Israel and Palestine. And fact, the fact that I've been very critical of some politicians in this country uh, who are enthusiastic supporters of Israel. Uh, so I think that's why she didn't feel comfortable meeting with me. But at the end of the day, it was what it was. I had to make a decision whether or not to run based upon very little knowledge of who she was. So I decided uh, to enter the race because I just couldn't see anybody. I didn't have the confidence that anybody else who had entered the race was going to present a radical agenda. Uh, I didn't want it. I didn't really you know, want to assume the position of leadership in a political party. I had deep skepticism about electoral politics, but it seemed to me that the country was in desperate need of a radical voice at the federal level uh, and certainly not being provided by the NDP either. So uh, I entered the race and then I started casting about for a campaign team and I went to people who were close friends of mine, politically aligned with me, you know, comfortable with eco-socialism, but uh, none of whom was really a professional campaigner. Uh, some of whom had no prior history with the Green Party at all. Uh, some of them were political independents on the left. Others had had a long but dissatisfying association with the NDP. And some of them were longtime Greens. And we came together and at the beginning, it was just a mess. Our campaign was a complete mess. Uh, we had no real plan. But as time went by, we began to, uh, I think, operate like a well-oiled machine. We began to see that our message of eco-socialism was resonating with people. It gave us a great deal of motivation to, uh, you know, come together, build the team, strengthen our message. And by the time, you know, we got to third or four month of the leadership contest, the fundraising showed that we were in second place. Uh, and even though I think it's fair to say that the former leader, Elizabeth May, was, uh, I think, and I, she subsequently, I think, acknowledged this in the Toronto Star op-ed, she was quite visibly supportive of Annamie Paul at that stage and was um, quite viscerally opposed to my leadership bid. Uh, so despite the, those facts, you know, we were very close uh, to being number one in fundraising. Uh, and ultimately, you know, uh, we finished uh, second place on the eighth and final ballot. On the fifth ballot, I was actually in the lead. Um, so I, you know, I didn't feel at all bitter about the outcome. I felt very uh, uh, inspired by it, frankly, that so many people supported the campaign despite the obstacles we confronted. You know, in terms of whether I feel vindicated, I, I think what happened to Enemy is, you know, really sad. Um, it's hard to feel vindicated, really. I mean, I feel vindicated in the sense that the leadership contest, I don't believe fundamentally it was fair. The, you know, the former leader declared on national television before I entered the race that she was going to be scrupulously neutral. Those were her words. She wasn't, she's admitted as much now. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, that certainly wasn't something that I was happy about, uh, but I never would have wished upon enemy or anybody who became a leader what happened. It was a terrible year that we've gone through. Uh, and I think we as a party have a lot of work to do to recover our credibility with Canadians. Mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, a, a lot of, you know, Canadians that uh, stand by watch and looking for a radical alternative to basically the status quo in terms of domestic and foreign policy are we we look at basically what happened what happened with the green party and we end up you know sighing 
Um, there was a particularly contentious vote when that uh, uh, by party, the Communist Party, was viscerally opposed to, and that was uh, the the declaration that uh, China was uh, committing a genocide. Um, the Green Party ended up voting along with the Conservatives and the NDP, declaring genocide, saying that the Winter Olympics should be boycotted. Um, I know that a lot of people don't realize that the responsibility to protect doctrine um, was something pushed by NATO in the UN and what that ends up meaning um, from, from a warmongering standpoint when you declare that a country is committing a, a, a genocide. Um, what, what is your take on that? What, what, how do you feel about um, the party's position on foreign policy in that respect? And then, uh, you know, the, their position on, on Israel and its occupation? Well, with respect to China, I disagree with the party's stance. I, I think that the party, that our MPs were wrong to jump so quickly on the genocide bandwagon. Um, let me say, first of all, that uh, I th think the evidence is quite clear that the Chinese government has been dealing for a number of years with a very serious, uh, real problem of uh, terrorism in Xinjiang. Uh, I do believe that the government has uh, reacted in a rather draconian way to the terrorist threat, uh, and that it has, it has suppressed civil liberties to an unacceptable degree. I do think that there are human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang, which I believe are largely driven by this overreaction uh, to what is the real uh, significant terrorist threat. Uh, but uh, I don't believe that it's really any different and quite arguably not as severe as the reaction of Western states uh, to the terrorist threat that emerged in 9-11. Uh, you know, for, for example, as we all know, in, re in response to the 9-11 attacks uh, and based entirely on fraudulent intelligence, the United States essentially laid waste to an entire country, Iraq, which had absolutely nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. The, the United States government engaged in torture uh, at Guantanamo and other black sites around the world. And then you know, when Barack Obama came to power, he basically washed his hands of it and said, I'm not going to hold any of these torturers accountable, even though he himself in his first, uh, you know, his first bid for the Democratic nomination openly acknowledged that the United States had engaged in torture. And we could go on and on, you know, the, the war in Afghanistan, uh, uh, the destruction of Libya, over and over again, you know, the West, Western governments over the past 20 years have used the threat of terrorism and a purported concern for human rights in order to engage in the most heinous acts of brutality. Uh, and I, I really don't view, I, I, don't, I don't condone at all. And in fact, I condemn any abridgment of the human rights of the Uyghur people by the Chinese government. And I believe there has been, there have been abuses, but uh, I don't think we're really in a position of any moral authority to lecture the Chinese about that in light of our own abominable human rights record, and particularly the way we dealt with the threat of terrorism in the post 9-11 period. Uh, now, furthermore, it's a little known fact that the State Department in the month leading up to uh, the Trump administration's declaration that China was committing genocide, and this was something that happened, I believe, on the last day of the Trump presidency, the timing of it stunk to high heaven. State Department attorneys advised Donald Trump that they believe that there was insufficient evidence to accuse China of genocide. This is the State Department's own attorneys. You know, this is something that uh, the Canadian government and our parliament completely ignored. And how, what was the basis upon which they accused China of genocide? Well, they brought, you know, they, they, they conducted these hearings before a human rights uh, committee of, uh, of parliament at which, uh, you know, every single individual who was brought forward was somebody who had embraced essentially the genocide narrative. There was nobody who came forward to present an alternative point of view. Uh, I actually checked with the clerk of that committee. No representative of the Chinese government was invited to respond to the extremely serious allegations being made against it by these witnesses. The star witness was this clown by the name of Adrian Zentz, a far-right uh, end-of-worlder who is has really no significant expertise in 
uh, Xinjiang whatsoever and has a clear political agenda and whose methodologies have been, uh, I think, exposed in some respects as being outright fraudulent uh, in terms of, you know, the evidence he's put forward or so-called evidence he's put forward in support of the genocide allegation. So I'm deeply troubled, although I accept and, uh, and, I, and I, I condemn unequivocally <laughs> that there are human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang. Uh, the Uyghur people have seen their civil liberties abridged in a quite serious way. I don't believe that the evidence establishes that China has committed genocide. I think that this is highly politically motivated and it's extremely dangerous uh, because we desperately need to uh, deal cooperatively with the Chinese on a range of pressing security issues, most importantly, the climate crisis. Uh, we need to deal with them on the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, you know, when we look at uh, military spending and the, and, and the distribution of military forces in the world, it is ridiculous for us to characterize the state of China as the aggressor in its relations with the West. The United States government spends, I believe, almost four times as much as its military on China. It has over 800 military bases in foreign countries. The Chinese state has one foreign military base. Uh, it has, a, I think, a few hundred nuclear weapons. The United States has thousands of nuclear weapons. It is the Western military forces who are sending military vessels into the South China Sea, into the Strait of Taiwan. It's not the Chinese who are sending, you know, belligerent forces off of our uh, coastlines uh, threatening us. So uh, I think that our policies towards China are morally bankrupt. I think they're extremely dangerous. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, we simply do not have the moral authority to lecture the Chinese or anybody else about human rights because of the fact that we've aligned ourselves with the United States government. We've aligned ourselves with the state of Israel, which is committing the crime of apartheid. We've aligned ourselves with Saudi Arabia, which is committing a genocide in Yemen before the eyes of the world, murdered a Washington Post journalist in cold blood, you know, brutally suppresses women, brutally suppresses the Shia minority in the south of the country. Who are we to lecture the Chinese about human rights? We have absolutely no credibility, none whatsoever, to lecture anybody about human rights. Uh, and so I think we really need to start if we're going to if we're going to have discussions with other countries, especially powerful countries with whom we need to be cooperating to deal with existential crises confronting us, we first need to establish our own moral authority. And we are far from having done that. We've undermined it completely. That's a very powerful statement. Um, and um, it's good to see that within the Green Party, there are people with acting on principle when it comes to foreign policy. Um, although we don't necessarily agree on everything, it's good to, that there's that dynamics within uh, you know, the yeah. left current. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to ask um, what your um, take is on you know, the recent discovery that kind of led to the cancellation of the holiday on, on July 1st, the discovery of the mass graves um the the stark the staunch reality that really reconciliation hasn't really been addressed and that that the legacy of colonialism isn't just supported it's also it's also been enacted directly by this government by the canadian government what what, what are your thoughts on that yeah, look i think the, the, the genocide is gone going in this country it never actually ended you know the, the worst most horrific aspects of it are, have stopped. The residential school system was mercifully ended. Uh, one of the greatest, you know, atrocities imaginable, the residential schools children, what has done to those children, my God. I mean, this is a scar in the conscience of our nation, which you've not even begun to deal with in a meaningful way. Uh, but at least it's not, the system doesn't continue to exist. Uh, you know, we, we, we have, there was some level of compensation paid to the victims, although it was grossly inadequate in my opinion. Uh, but the uh, legacy of genocide continues when you know we see, for example, that uh, indigenous communities around the country don't have access to clean water. We would never tolerate this in predominantly white communities, but we do with indigenous peoples. When we see what's being done uh, you know, on, for example, Wet'suwet'en wet lands, where uh, despite an existential climate emergency, we're basically sending in militarized police to brutally suppress legitimate resistance by indigenous peoples to extractive activities on their lands. 
uh, you know, when you look at the level of the gross over representation of indigenous persons and also black persons in our correctional system, our so-called correctional system. Uh, you know, when you look at the, the poverty, the lack of adequate health care in indigenous communities, the, 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 the crime of genocide is an ongoing crime in this country. It's, its worst features have only been attenuated somewhat, but it's by no means been ended. Uh, and this too has been, it's quite apart from the fact that it is just fundamentally wrong. That too is depriving us of moral authority to play a leadership role in the defense of human rights domestically and internationally. We have absolutely no credibility. You know, the Chinese government often talks about our violations of indigenous rights. Shouldn't surprise anybody that they do so. You know, nobody listens, of course. The mainstream media never repeats those critiques. Uh, but uh, they're entirely correct to point out that we have absolutely no credibility when it comes to human rights, just based upon our own treatment of indigenous peoples. Uh, so I, I personally believe that, first of all, for us to, to even begin to deal with the problem of uh, the suppression of indigenous rights in a meaningful way, we have to give indigenous peoples a veto over extractive activities on their lands, an outright veto. Right now, what we have in this country is a duty to consult, which is routinely flouted by federal and provincial governments and by extractive corporations. You know, and what that means is, is that at the end of the day, if they consult and they say, well, we heard you, we're just going to proceed anyways with the extractive activities on your lands, they're permitted to do that. You know, under, under UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, they have a right of veto and consultation is not adequate. Even real consultation is not adequate. If they say no, we have to respect their decision. It has to be the decision of those who represent them according to their own laws and customs, not the people we say represent them under our laws and customs. Uh, and the other thing I think we should do, and this is something I campaigned on in the leadership contest, is we should allocate a fixed percentage of Canadian GDP every year to Indigenous communities so that they have a substantial and predictable source of funding coming from the economic activities uh, which are happening to a significant extent on their lands. Uh, and only then, look, you know, you can't deal with social injustice without massive wealth redistribution. Whether you're talking about Indigenous persons, whether you're talking about racialized persons in other communities, whether you're talking about the working poor in the white community, you, we need to affect a massive dis redistribution of wealth in order to have a socially just society. You know, that's the reality. And this is something that I really, I really believe the Green Party has to say much more loudly, clearly and courageously than it has in the past. You know, we have to take from the rich and give to the poor. End of story. And I'm talking about a massive redistribution of wealth, not a minor one like that pathetic 1% wealth tax that the NDP has been advocating for, which at the end is a Band-Aid will accomplish nothing. Excellent. I mean, you're... Sounding pretty radical to me. Um, I think that's the reason why you didn't win, uh, to be quite honest. But to, I'll tell you, Christian, I, I actually, you know, I know it is radical by the standards of Canadian politics, but to me, this is just like basic human decency, right? Yeah. Like it's, what's radical, extreme, is that we have 10 people controlling 80, 90 billion dollars of wealth, while we have tens of thousands of people living in the streets in this country. That's extremism. I'm just talking about basic human decency. Mm -hmm. And that kind of segues into our final question. Do you think Canadian pol uh, politics will be better served with a more powerful communist party? Yes or no? Yes, 100%. Uh, you know, the communist party, uh, it, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Europe uh, over the course of my professional life, uh, you know, and partly because I am Greek and have family in Greece. You know, communists are routinely elected to uh, political office in European countries. You know, in Greece, they routinely get 5% of the vote. Uh, at one point, I think they were th re relatively recently the third largest party in the Greek parliament. Uh, there are communists who've been elected in Portugal. Uh, in India, uh, communists are in power in the state of Kerala, and they're doing a wonderful job, by the way, of uh, redistributing wealth in that country and supporting the poor and ensuring everybody has their basic needs met. You know, I think Canada and the United States would benefit greatly from having, uh, you know, a robust communist party, which actually has representation in uh, provincial and federal legislatures. Uh, and, and, you know, 
are presenting a different perspective on how to deal with the, the, the fundamental injustices in our society than, than Canadians are being given. Our political discourse would be greatly enriched by that. That is an excellent answer. And uh, <laughs> with that, we are going to uh, conclude the show uh, with the song that uh, Dimitri Lascaris picked. Uh, Dimitri, what's the song we're, uh, we're show ending the show with? Uh, it's a rise sun. It's a, uh, it comes from a recent movie actually called the card counter. Uh, it would, I recommend you watch the movie, not so much because it's about a card counter, but, uh, it's, it's actually about uh, the person happens to be a card counter, but it's a person who emerged from the Canadian and, or the United States intelligence community and had a very dark past. And the story is really about that person coming to terms with the horrible things he did in the name of the security of the United States. Uh, and this 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 song, uh, Arise Sun, is really, I think it does a wonderful job of conveying, uh, you know, the emotional uh, trauma uh, that that movie uh, exposed uh, and so powerfully. Excellent. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, we're going to be concluding. Uh, we're going to do the outro and then we're going to have uh, Dimitri Lascaris' song. That'll be the end of the show. We'll see you next week. Social Thank you.